This is a good day to serve God. Life without Jesus is pointless. Life without purpose will be powerless. I want us to understand one thing and one of the reasons why we have this meeting. It's not only for people who are coming outside but also those who are coming every week to our church to be reminded of this. Life without purpose will be a life without point. Life with a purpose will find meaning, life with a purpose will find power and life with a purpose will find miracles. You know I'm so glad that our church has a vision and I'm so glad that a lot of churches have vision to see people give their lives to Jesus. If we won't, if my pastor wouldn't have the vision to see people come to Jesus, we must understand one thing is when one person gives their life to Jesus, behind that decision are miracles. You know, Tatiana mentioned that she had gastritis for 10 years. If she wouldn't find Jesus, she wouldn't be able to find the healing from gastritis of 10 years. My faith wouldn't be encouraged by that miracle. A young lady who gave her life to Jesus last Wednesday, at the same night, had two problems, one in her knee and one in her shoulder, was healed instantly right after that decision. This would have not happened if decision if decision of the church to see people come to Jesus wouldn't be the focus and the priority. Another problem we must understand is that when we don't focus on bringing people to the Lord as Christians, not only they are not going to go to heaven, the people they can bring to heaven will also not make it there. You know as of the day that Eric came to our church, there probably has been hundreds of people who has heard the message of the gospel because of Eder's testimony. Imagine how many people will hear the gospel for the further of his life, the baby's life and other people who will get impacted through his life. We must understand each person that comes to Jesus Christ is a door to thousands and thousands of other people who are ready and who wants to serve Jesus Christ. And that's why we must be eager and we must be passionate as individuals who follow Jesus Christ to make it our aim and to make it our purpose. Not just to win lottery, not just to build a house, not just simply to have a car, not just to finish education, not just to get married, you know, get a truck, get a dog and go on a vacation. We got to make it our aim, something that Jesus lived for, died for, sent the Holy Spirit for, builds the church for and is coming back for. Not for streets, cities or buildings but for people. Everything will die but one thing that will live and remain is souls of people because they are eternal. Because somebody say amen. amen. I'm so happy because our church started many years ago with my pastor and my pastor he was a missionary in Russia for many years and some of you can see the pictures he will be probably surprised what I got those pictures <laughs> and so he was a missionary in Russia he left Ukraine to go to another country to be a missionary to preach the gospel and he started many churches there in Russia and so when he came to United States he didn't come to United States to start an aquarium you know what aquarium is it's when you keep the fish our pastor wanted to start the church that will be like an ark that will rescue the fish. He wanted to start the church that will reach out to people in our community that don't know Jesus. Well the only problem was that my pastor did not speak English and the people he wanted to start with didn't speak English either. And so in the beginning when the church was started our church had no building, our church had no money, my pastor had no license and our church didn't have even the most important thing you need to bring people to Jesus, the language. Our church only had one thing. My pastor had a vision. Most churches today have buildings, budgets, skills and talents but they don't have one most important thing, the vision. And the Bible does not say God's people perish because of lack of buildings, budgets or skills. Bible says God's people perish for lack of vision. When there is lack of vision what happens to people is they simply come, they become bench warmers, window watchers, they're spectators not participators and their life is just in a circle. There is no miracles, no salvations and even if that building is filled with a lot of people but if people don't meet Jesus Christ that building does not fulfill its real purpose. 
and my pastor started with the vision and I believe that's how every church should start with the vision when it started with the vision there was just a small flock a small group of people that would meet <laughs> if you can place that picture when we were in the uh, west side and this was the leadership team I was also in the worship I've done everything <laughs> we started as a church very small and uh, but we had a very big vision we didn't speak English but we decided we will learn English see most people learn English to get a job we were learning English to help bring people to church <laughs> had a completely different reason for learning English most people went to school to get education we had to go to school to get people and stuff so it was a different purpose that our pastor has trained us from the beginning and because my pastor was in Russia and in the 90s the techniques to bring people to Jesus were different they were you know going to the streets going to the parks standing on the corner streets and that's exactly what he encouraged us with and so as kids we would go to parks stand there like a little mariachi band <laughs> and try to sing songs hoping that we could draw people to the message of Jesus we would hold posters go on the streets and simply try to tell people Jesus loves them devil hates you there is a youth rally and all of our young ladies were beautiful so we didn't get any salvations but we got a lot of weird names called Aras when I was a teenager and I was in school I also would stack a big stack of flyers and try to go and staple the whole school with flyers trying to bring people to church because that's the best we knew how and it was not the most effective way but our passion was burning with time God gave us more sufficient and better ways uh, to witness. Some of them were eating worms, jousting, boxing, renting a memorial park here in Pasco and trying to draw as many people to the message of good news as we could. But I think we found that one of the best ways to bring people to Jesus is to understand first of all, you must know as a Christian the Holy Spirit. Why? because the Holy Spirit comes to make you a witness now most people think that means Holy Spirit will make me a preacher or a person who can debate someone into coming to Jesus witness is someone that the Holy Spirit touches your life to that degree that you have something to witness about and you don't have to be on drugs to be a witness you don't have to be addicted to alcohol to be a witness you don't have to be sick to be a witness you have to have the Holy Spirit to be a witness because you can be a prosperous person when the Holy Spirit touches you experience something supernatural which gives you a right to be a witness you don't have to have a Bible degree to be a witness you have to be a person who experienced something I remember when uh, a year and a half ago my uh, my cousin David who was set free from seven years of drugs and then not only he was on drugs but he was on heavy drugs and he went to the ministry of prophet Tibi Joshua and God supernatural delivered him demons came out of him and he was completely free David didn't finish college he didn't even finish high school his license was suspended he was not witness in the religious perspective that what David had is what most Christians don't he had a contact with the Holy Spirit that made him a witness so he would go to gym and work out like he always does most of you already know who he is who I'm talking about because he's in the gym all the time that is his witnessing field he would go in and he would start a conversation because he used to do drugs people who used to do drugs they are talkative very talkative and very unashamed and so he would come to the strangest people and begin to talk to them not about theology not about religion but begin to tell them I gotta tell you I was on drugs this was happened demons came out of me like real demons came out like can you imagine me demons yeah white boy demons came out of me and I was set free and God can set you free and God can touch you and he went to sauna and there was another gentleman sitting there and he started telling him about his story see Holy Spirit makes you a witness gives you something to talk about most people say well I need to tell people they're going to hell that is very important to tell them that make sure that comes after you tell them your witness your witness is not just about Jesus it's about Jesus who touched you and how he touched you and your story might be different than David's your story might be different than mine but your story is unique because the Holy Spirit touched you can somebody say amen 
and he would talk to Louis he told him the whole story and when you're when you're when you're sitting in sun you have to sit there only for 15 minutes and after you have to leave when David starts to talk you don't have 15 minutes you're going to be sitting there until you pass out or until they carry you out and after a while you know Louis looked at him he's like hey I, I gotta go I'm dying here he's like oh yeah that's right you can go but that testimony because it came as a result of Holy Spirit touching him touched Louis where two months later Louis approached David tapped him on the shoulder and said remember the time that you almost killed me over there in the sauna telling me your story he said well whatever you said has touched my heart you don't know I'm actually also addicted to drugs and it's been two months after that story I have not used drugs he hasn't come to church at that time yet what happened the testimony is what the Holy Spirit produces within you most people think well I have the Holy Spirit I speak in tongues that's not the main function of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer is to make you speak in tongues it's to make you a witness tongues are the bonus witness is the primary reason can somebody say amen, amen. this young man Louis comes for the first time on the Wednesday night the altar call was given Louis gives his life to Jesus and Louis does not know much about God he does not know much about the doctrine he didn't go to Bible school yet next Wednesday there's already one more person with him I was like how did you convince him to come to church without knowing the difference between sanctification regeneration and sanctification see the words are the same Louis is like I just told them I was on drugs somebody told me that I could be free I came here it helped me I'm free from drugs and they told me they have the same problem and they came here and you didn't debate, didn't explain to them about Ten Commandments. He's like, Ten what? <laughs> when we gave Louis a Bible first time, he couldn't understand it. He says, this is a Shakespeare's writings. So he had to find a kid's Bible somewhere in his parents' house and read it because it helped him to understand the Bible. Only later on, he started to understand the real Bible. And what I saw in him and many other young men and young women, most of them know a little bit less about God than I do. But they have had some of them greater experiences with the Holy Spirit in their personal lives which makes them a witness you're not a witness because you know everything about the Bible you're a witness because you came in contact with the Holy Spirit he touched your life and that is your argument to draw people to Jesus Christ God didn't call us to win debates he calls us to win souls and somebody say amen and so because a lot of witnessing that we have in our mind is like we used to do what we do on Friday nights is we would have a prayer and then afterwards all of us would huddle up we would pray like martyrs you know going to like you know die we would go at 11 o'clock to bars people coming out of the bars are drunk and we would approach them in this uh, Russian accent leather jackets you know the collars picked out pull in on a beamer hey I, I gotta tell you about Jesus and the guy would be drunk and he's thinking we're drunk too so he's like yeah that's all what's up yeah Jesus my homeboy we're like no 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 not like that and we would go to the mall we would go to Walmart find somebody at one o'clock and drop, corner them see them make sure there's no cameras like three guys surround them and begin to try to ch talk to them about God and try to bring the fear of God on them right there and so we don't know what they were scared of us and God but but the thing about it is that not many people would come to Jesus yes we got kicked out of the mall yes we got kicked out we were so happy we're like yes for Jesus we're suffering <laughs> and and that's good there's that's that's not bad the people would stop on the red light and we would we would have thousands of flyers and the, in cities it's really hot so the windows are rolled down guess what we would do in between the cars throw the flyers in and when somebody would notice the little little guys walk into their car to roll up the window well we had another option pull the windshield wipers and put it right underneath of it and I guess you know what that's how we, we were radical ignorant a little bit but that's not the most effective way of seeing people come to Jesus not many people can debate not many people can stand with the flyer with the poster but every person can ask their co-worker after they ask them how was your weekend to tell them where you did and you spend your weekend and invite them over to the next youth service and sometimes that's how simple it is somebody receives an invitation gives their life to Jesus and their life is changed my friend who just recently gave his life to the Lord goes to a restaurant and there was another guy he meets him just casually unlike Brittany he didn't take seven months just he met them in a restaurant says hey 
I've been coming to this church. God touched my life. Would you, you want to come? He's like, yeah, I'll, I'll check it out. This young man comes to the church. He's an atheist. Engineer. Went to an army. Some bad things happened to his life. That service he comes. God touches him. But he doesn't give his life to Jesus. The next service he comes. His heart melts. He gives his life to Jesus. And last month he was baptized. That's how simple it could be. Because somebody say amen. I just want to just share a few simple thoughts from the Word of God. We already took a lot of time. We want to take time to pray today for souls. I know that when it comes to evangelism, when it comes to sharing our faith, we have heard so much and our goal is not to try to tell you something new that you haven't heard. Our goal is not to try to give you some little trick or technique. Our goal is to inspire each one of us and ourselves included. This is our purpose. This is our mission and none of us should use any excuses from doing it. We should find a way and see it accomplished. Can somebody say amen? amen? Let's go to John chapter 15 verse 7 and it says the following. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done to you. Can somebody say amen? amen? John chapter 15 is the whole parable about the vine. And Jesus starts out to tell us that there is a father and father is like the farmer. He's the vine dresser. He's the guy who's taking care of the vine. And he plants the vine and then he takes care of the vine and this vine serves a purpose to produce fruit. The vine serves the purpose that the farmer plants to produce a fruit. And Jesus explains and he says that my father is that farmer. I'm the vine. I am God. But he planted me on this earth as the vine. That's why we as Christians believe Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. If you don't understand that simple revelation, you will always be confused at the phrases like Jesus slept. God doesn't sleep. Jesus was weary. God never gets weary. God, Jesus prayed to the Father. How could God pray to God? Confusing. It's very simple. Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. So God the Father sends Jesus and plants him on this earth as the vine. For one reason, to produce fruit. What was that fruit? What was the reason for Jesus' life on this earth? Well, angels announced it when he was born and they told Mary and they told other people that he is born so that people will be saved. Satan tempted him in the wilderness and says that you shouldn't do the will of God. You should simply come and follow fame. You should follow this, but you shouldn't go to the cross. You shouldn't die for people. When Jesus was getting famous and things were getting really good and Jesus kept telling his disciples, I am going to die for the humanity and disciples would come and pull him to the side and say, Jesus, this does not look good on your resume. This does not going to help you to win the politi politics here. People don't like martyrs. They like successful, ambitious, confident people. And here you are talking so negative about yourself. Jesus, snap out. And Jesus turns to Peter and said, devil, get behind me. Because the devil was tempting him with the ambition, self-preservation, with life goals so that he will be distracted from his mission on earth. See, devil wasn't tempting Jesus with drugs. He was tempting him with ambition, life preservation and things that most of us chase in life. Those were the things Jesus was tempted by. Because his aim in life wasn't to be pretty. His aim in life wasn't to be famous. His aim in life was not to be cute. His aim in life wasn't even to win a popularity contest. His aim in life was one. I came to seek and save that which was lost. His aim in life was this. For God so loved the world that he gave. He planted a vineyard on this planet so that whoever comes and believes in him will not die but have everlasting life. And I am thankful for that. Can somebody say amen? Can somebody put your hands together for Jesus for that? <laughs> Jesus was the greatest at his mission. Most people think Jesus came to teach us how to live. He never wrote a book. Never left us a manual. Some people say Jesus came to teach us how to be nice to other people. That is 100% but that's not what's his purpose. He came to live for souls and die for souls 
and left us with the same responsibility and same mission. He was so radical in his mission. He would walk to men's business. A guy is doing taxes. Jesus says, come follow me. The guy would just drop his job without like a two, two day or two week notice and follow Jesus. Jesus would come take somebody's boat and says, can I borrow this? Peter didn't know what he was getting himself into. The moment Jesus borrowed his boat, the next thing you know, G Peter is dropping the whole business and following after Jesus. See, most people think Jesus came on this earth to help you find the business. Well, when he was on this earth, a lot of guys lost his business because they found a higher business of saving the lost. When Jesus even was on the cross, you know, this is a time where you kind of forget about the witnessing part. When you're dying, while there complaining to God, why have you forsaken me? He turns to another guy and realizes one guy is sold out going to hell. He just doesn't want to even repent of his sin. But another guy is showing signs of repentance and showing help. And Jesus there on the cross dying for humanity's sin takes a moment and saves one more soul. That's radical. That's how he lived. His mission was not even to be famous, wealthy. His mission was one, bring fruit. He was divine. You're like, awesome. I am saved because of that. Well, we have a little problem because Jesus produced branches and you and I are the branch. Say, I'm the, I'm the branch. If you're a Christian, you're the branch. Now imagine a vine that focuses on producing a fruit, but a branch is obsessed with looking cute. So the vine's purpose is to bring fruit, but the purpose of the branch is to show up, show off, and just to live for other reasons than the same purpose than the vine. I want to tell us something as Christians. Uh, this is a reminder. You probably have heard this. If you haven't, let this be a reminder to you. You and I, as a Christian, don't have a luxury of having any other reason for our existence than the one Jesus had for his. Why? God doesn't call you the roof and Jesus is the foundation. Foundation is made of concrete, the roof is made of shingles. Different material, different purpose. You and I are branch. That means we have to be just like him. A vine cannot produce grapes and the branch is producing oranges. The vine cannot produce grapes and the branch is producing something else. That is something is wrong here. So Jesus is telling us the reason I lived was for the lost and you are my branch. See God the Father loved the earth so he planted me. I did my job and I leave and I'm, my mission will continue. I will make you and that mission will be continued through you the same way it was continued through me. But for most of us that mission is stuck here. We say things like I don't speak English. It's funny you have a degree. You're doing business with everyone who speaks English but you completely go numb and you cannot speak English when it comes to inviting somebody to church. Some people say well I just don't know. I'm just too shy. I'm just do this and we use all kinds of excuses to say I can't produce the fruit. I'm just not those fanatics. I'm not one of those crazy people. Leave me alone. I just want to come to church, sit and leave for the ease of my consciousness. I just want to receive salvation and be done with it. But Jesus says, you don't have the luxury because you are not a dirt. You are my branch. You have the same nature as I do. And because of that, you have the same mission as I had when I was on this earth. Can somebody say amen? That's why our churches must be hospitals for the lost instead of museums for the perfect people. That's why our churches must be a place where the lost person doesn't necessarily comes and gets approved of everything he does but comes and feels loved and belonged before they believe. Because many times we come to a place where you come and unless you believe and become different you will never feel belong. It's interesting, Jesus never called his disciples to say, come, change, and then you will follow me. He says, follow me, and then I will change you, and only at the end they actually believed. 
how many people would believe faster if we would help them to belong quicker we gotta allow people to belong one of the first things when our church started to focus on souls that we had to change is that our services and I know right now we have different people here so it's, it'll be a little bit more complicated but if you come on a regular Wednesday service you will find one thing our church is one of the most friendliest churches in town and it's not because we're nice before you give us the credit no 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 we're just as bad as everybody else if you catch us in a bad mood because we have a mission bigger than the mood of the day we have to have a mission bigger than our personality trait I'm just shy I'm just not a talkative person well that has to go in the trunk because the mission is the priority one of the first things that happens in churches many times when the lost come is people are in their cliques you walk in you sit there nobody comes and says hi nobody gets your number nobody finds out what you're doing and the moment church ends you literally you feel like you're a plague in that environment everybody is avoiding you everybody's running away and everybody's secretly saying in Applebee's make sure she doesn't hear that so she doesn't show up there and we'll have to pay for her and then we have to be all awkward because we all know what's going on and she's brand new that hinders people from believing in Jesus Christ I know this is something so practical but some people's eternities hang on practical things because somebody say amen. amen and so we learn that as branch our purpose and aim in life is the same that Jesus had in his and that is to see people saved to see people come to God and to see people get to know Jesus the verse that we read today is actually saying that after all of this is done Jesus is saying when you make it your aim to serve people when you make it your aim to draw people to salvation at the end he says whatever you ask me actually he said whatever you want and you ask me I will give it to you so many times we take the scripture we're like hey man I want me a Lamborghini you know I want me that girl God she's my wife you know I want me a nice house I want me a good-looking body and we begin to fantasize and go beyond Disney World dreams and we begin to throw it on the scriptures name it claim it bless it possess it and we just begin to take it in says this has to work and we pray once we pray second time we pray third time and it's not working you have to understand that Jesus gives this promise to those who have submitted to the purpose of the branch in other words he's saying I will answer your call if you answer mine my call for your life is to see people saved. my call for your life is to see people changed I'm calling you imagine you get a phone call and sometimes you're busy doing something else and you ignore the call so this is God calling you saying today if you're a Christian if you're not a believer today you can just kind of sit back and just listen to the Christians once you become a Christian tonight you this can apply to you too but just gonna sit there let me just gonna talk to us for a moment you have a free pass if you're a Christian God is calling you not to just to Africa India or Mexico he is calling you sometimes across the room across the street across the bedroom to another person in your own house who is your sister or your brother and he says I want you to be my branch I want you to live for the purposes I lived on this earth when we pick up the call when we answer the call he says now when you call me I'm gonna answer also because you answered my call many times people don't understand the difference between the career and calling see a career is something you choose in school calling is something God chose on a cross the moment Jesus came and died on this world for sins of people your calling was already chosen people sometimes wait they're like I just want to know my calling and I spent 15 years I just want to know my calling what many people are actually wanting to know is their career and about career God says whatever you want to do, do as long as it's not you know smoking pot or selling pot or doing some other illegal and sinful things as long as it makes you money and brings people happiness and makes you feel good do it but that's your career your calling you don't choose your calling that's chosen for you how is that chosen divine 
the calling for the vine was chosen by the farmer and the calling of the branch was chosen by the vine your calling was chosen by Jesus Christ your career is chosen by your personality your desires and your wishes your career is what you can change you don't like being an accountant you can become an owner of the company if you don't like working at that job you can switch jobs and you don't have to go to a prophet and fast for five days is it the will of God for me to move from management to the upper management if you like it do it your career can change your calling never changes whether you become a CEO or homeless it's still the same whether you're healthy or sick it's still the same our callings never change whether we are a preacher, a home group leader, or tomorrow you relocate to another church and you go to that church and maybe the focus is not on souls, your calling does not change with territory, it does not change with a nationality group, it does not change with weather. If the government tells us you can't preach about Jesus, our calling does not change on our government. It changes by God and God says it won't change until He brings everyone to salvation. Can somebody say amen? That's why when my pastor moved to Tri-Cities, that's why when our pastor moved to Tri-Cities, this was a different language. This was a different culture. People said, well, you already did over there. Now you just can relax in Tri-Cities. But my pastor said, see, my career can change in Tri-Cities. But my calling cannot change. I have to learn the English. I have to find a way. I have to raise another generation. I have to find a building. Why? Because once God calls you, He does not change that. That stays with you for the rest of your life. Can somebody say amen? A career is what gives you money. Your calling is what gives you purpose. Amen. It's what gives you fulfillment. It's what gives you miracles. It's what takes you to another level with God. If you answer his call, he wants to pick up yours. What would happen if God would treat our prayers the way we treat his purpose? Actually, that's exactly probably how he treats our prayers that's why you see one thing when people don't get saved in places you will rarely see miracles in those places you will rarely see people's lives being changed you see one thing about young people where people are not focused on salvation young people are lethargic complacent whiners self-righteous judgmental and they can build a facade but inside there is no relationship and love and life with the holy spirit there's emptiness. Why? Because life comes from fulfilling our call. You may go to be a missionary in another country. You may be a pastor, you may be a musician. Remember, all of these are different aspects of the calling. The main calling is to draw people to salvation. Can somebody say amen? In the conclusion, I want to finish that. Many years ago, I struggled with, um, I had two major problems. Well, I had many problems, but two major ones. When I was a teenager. One of them is that I was extremely insecure and I was very very shy and the second problem is that I had migraine headaches. These migraine headaches made my life very miserable especially when it was really hot in Tri-Cities and those of you who live in Tri-Cities it's almost always hot in Tri-Cities. My headaches were so severe that sometimes I had to pop, pop pills and it just made my life very difficult because though the pills will subside the sharpness of the pain it would still my head would feel like a vegetable like a little jello there. And I prayed and I prayed. I was a Christian. I, I went to church. My parents took me to church and I would consider myself not a, not a bad person. I didn't do anything foolish. I wasn't holy or perfect but I was in church reading the Bible and everything and I was praying and I felt like because I was in church, because I didn't do anything foolish and I was better than the rest of my friends, that God would just quickly heal me and touch me and bless me. And I would pray to God to remove my insecurities. I would pray to God to remove my, my headaches but it seemed like healing and deliverance for my soul was not coming until one day I started to change my prayer and I found this I thought it was tricky but I heard it from someone else so I decided to try it instead of asking God to heal me and deliver me I made a bargain with God and I said God you're looking for people well if you heal me you don't have to look for one more person and in, not in a prayer but in a mindset I started to fix my mind and says God if you can heal my insecurity from a guy who's in a freshman year 
in Hanford High School, skipping a keyboard in class because he's embarrassed to stand in front of a group of 25 students. If you can remove that insecurity out of this kid and remove my headaches, I give you a pledge. Since I'm already suffering, I know serving you is gonna be suffering too. So I'll rather choose to suffer without a headache and insecurity. I will serve you and do whatever you want me to do. I started to pray like that and I started to think like that. Two years passed and I've noticed that I have not had headaches. Now they probably happened some maybe once or twice or maybe five times but it was not noticeable and it was not it was no longer bothering me. My insecurity subsided to that degree where the kid who couldn't speak in front of 25 students became a kid at a senior high school who spoke in front of three and a half thousand people at the 9-11 memorial at the track. And when I spoke at that verse, everybody in high school the next day, I was like the priest, man. Everybody walked there, like, say, the scripture is walking right here. And so, and I mean, I became a, you know, a little popular in school. And so, and here I am, my grades are going up. I'm doing so good. And I'm like, man, this is awesome. It's so good to, to be a person who is not insecure. I'm not shy. I'm not afraid of to look people in the face. I'm already preaching in church. But to be honest with you, I didn't want to commit my life to this thing. I wanted to do this on the side. So when I would come to Sunday church, it's like a broken tape recorder playing. If you heal me, I will give you my life. The pastor is preaching about mercy and I'm only hearing, if you heal me, I will give you my life. And I'm like, pastor is preaching the truth. This is not the truth. And I try to wrestle with it. I'm a senior in high school in 12th grade and this wrestling became so intense because here I am I knew what God wanted me to do and I knew what I promised to him and what I promised is that I will dedicate all my life not a little bit of it what I promised to God is not that I will not smoke and drink and get high it's that I will serve completely to him but as things got better my withdrawal became a little bit more further and further and further until the battle inside got so intense that in my senior year I started to skip every Wednesday miss I'm sorry miss every Wednesday at high school and come here it was at this church lock myself upstairs from six in the morning till three four in the afternoon fast and pray to find out the will of God I knew the will of God I just didn't want to surrender six or seven months into it of fasting and praying on Wednesday to know the will of God I finally gave up and to me that meant this that I will have to work at the church and something I dreaded I didn't want to work at the church I didn't want to be anything involved like that I wanted to just serve here as a volunteer and that's it and I laid my life down I said whatever is gonna happen is going to happen little did I knew all of my fears were completely pathetic all of my worries were completely baseless and God flipped my life upside down and that's only just a small tiny beginning of the promises our church and I and all of us together are caring for the future but I want to tell you something if you're facing a problem you cannot solve make a deal with God pick up his call and then call him see if he will pick up if you're facing a sickness Tell God, if you heal me, I will give you my body. And I'm not talking about that I'm not going to shoot up drugs and not going to give my body to sleep with another man or another woman. No God, I will give my body to love on people. I will give my body to my mouth to speak your word. God, if you change me, if you set me free from this, God, I promise I'm not just going to tithe. I will be like Jesus. I will be a branch. You will be surprised how fast God can touch your world and touch your life. Can somebody say amen? And that's what we are here for this weekend. God wants to raise us up to deliver. God wants to change our lives so that we can be a generation that will touch other people in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's put our hands together for Jesus Christ one more time in the name of Jesus.